So Ashley received his PhD from Monash University and is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Latrobe University in Bendigo. So he's going to talk to today to us about combining expansion microscopy with single molecule localization microscopy. Great, thanks, Gabriella. Um, yeah, thanks to the RMS um, as well for the um, organizing committee for um, allowing me a chance to give a talk today. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about some of the uh, things that I've done with combining expansion microscopy and single molecule super resolution microscopy, and some of the approaches that I try to um, actually combine these two methods together. So a little bit of about me, um, I just started my, I did my diploma in uh, Singapore in Tomasic um, Polytechnic, and I did my undergrad at Monash and carried on to do my honors and PhD in Toby Bell's lab in the single molecule fluorescence lab there, um, where I was doing a lot of the, a lot of uh, developing a lot of super res techniques that I um, use now, including expansion. And then I postdoc for a bit with Toby and uh, Steve Turner, who's an immunologist, and we had, with Steve Turner, we had that motivation to do a bit more um, epigenetic uh, research, so applying the imaging technique to look at chromatin landscapes in immune cells. And right now, I'm a Holdsworth Biomedical Research Initiative postdoctoral fellow in Donald Whelan's lab um, up here in Bendigo um, in Victoria. Um, so the main things um, that we did in um, the, the, so well, the main reason we're doing super resolution is because conventional optical methods um, like a focal and wide field are diffraction limited such that your two single emitting points can only be distinguished, especially when you're talking about visible light, um, can only be distinguished um, with a minimum distance of 200 nanometers. And that is not sufficient to look and investigate subcellular structures. So that's where super resolution methods um, come in to bypass this limitation. And in our labs, what we did was, we, I mean, we routinely use a single molecule imaging approach that would give us um, as good as uh, 20 nanometer resolution. So there also, also can use um, SIM instead. Those are the other super resolution methods that are more, um, uh, hardware heavy, so you need specialized um, equipment to do that. But the single molecule methods are more sample based, so you need to have proper um, using the right fluorophores and using the right sample types and the right buffers um, to get it to work. And you tend to get slightly better resolution than STED or SIM. So that's what we we're working on. And the main principle with, behind um, single molecule imaging, or the one we used was D storm, was to induce a Photos, induce the photo switching of these um, fluorescent molecules so that they turn, so most of them are turning off in time. So for example, if you have a fluorescently labeled microtubule structure over here, you just image it with wide field fluorescence, you're gonna get all those emitters turning on at the same time. But if you induce photo switching in the right buffer with the right um, amount of high laser, you get this photo switching effect. It looks like single molecule blinking right here in the center. And what we then do is then we fit each of those single molecule emissions and we determine it determine its coordinate in X and Y and we reconstruct our single molecule image that improves our resolution by um, up to 10 times. And what I also did was, was able to extend this technique to 3D imaging. So instead of just looking at a symmetrical 2D single molecule emission, um, you can induce astigmatism to the emission point to extend it in either X and Y, and that encodes essentially its Z position in the sample. And so this, the single molecule um, blinking looks a bit, more, a bit more elongated in either direction, depending on its height. And then decoding that information based on the calibration, you can figure out the height of a sample. And so essentially a 3D D storm image. So again, here uh, with microtubules as our example and color coded for height where the red part of the cell is lower on the surface coming up to blue higher up. So this was um, sort of the bread and butter of um, my most of my PhD in um, using these techniques and then applying them to a series of biological applications 
uh, such as the effects of certain viral proteins and how, and how they affected some cellular structures, like the rabies phosphoprotein on microchipal bundling, the hepatobacterial matrix protein on subnuclear uh, structures. And these are also good at looking at how anti-cancer drugs at low doses were able to induce some significant changes in filament um, structure. And another project was also to use Superes to look at genomic on organization in primary T cell uh, nuclei, and I'll talk a bit about that later and how we use expansion to um, extend that project as well. So expansion microscopy, um, while we're all here, the method that I was prone to using most was the pro-EXM method uh, by Tilburg. And this method essentially is the one that uses the more commercially available uh, products. Uh, so, this, so the linker molecule, especially this Acrylo um, XSE, is the one that really um, was sort of the most niche product that you would need to get in order to perform this technique. And I was lucky enough that Fabian Svetla from uh, Marcus Sauer's lab at the time, who was doing his PhD as well, had come down to our lab to actually show me and show our lab how to do expansion microscopy. So he was able to show me all these tips and tricks on um, how, how to handle the sample correctly and how to make sure it um, you know, progresses on to the expanded stage. So the idea with this one is that you can use your conventional immunolabeling system. So if, if again, microtubules, primary and secondary labels with a fluorophore that is known to survive expansion microscopy. And I just saw that table um, that Gabriella was talking about, about fluorophores that actually can be used for expansion. So Alexafluor 532 is a good one. So once you have your immunolabeled structure, you attach, you just incubate your fixed label sample with this particular molecule that is a hybrid molecule that allows um, cross-linking onto protein structures and also onto your acrylamide gel later on. And then you add your acrylamide um, solution on and then you um, essentially create that gel, hydrogel, and then you digest it. So then you add it, your proteinase enzymes and you digest away your sample and you put your gel in water and that's essentially the expansion that's happening of, of your hydrogel up to about four times. Typically we measure it, um, that macro expansion effect is about four times. And if you just put that gel onto a conventional microscope, your resolution is improved by any specialized plus molecules or um, microscope hardware. So here are some um, COS7 fixed and labeled microtubules um, expanded and then imaged on a confocal system. So um, that's, I mean, that's one of the good things about you know, um, expansion. You can bring it to um, your imaging facilities or platforms and they are, and it's quite compatible, compatible with those microscopes. So this was done on a confocal microscope. Again, keeping an, an eye on the scale bars to see that they are the same, so same field of view, same magnification and we get a much um, larger sample and your microtubules are suddenly um, better resolved at this individual filament level, almost to the quality of um, a D-storm image. And of course, you also you don't really need a confocal microscope. So a wide field microscope is good enough to, um, to, have it, to, to get the improvements of expansion. So again, this is another cost seven a uh, fixed label sample before and after expansion. And you see, we get that improvement in um, individual filament resolution with just expansion microscopy. And so another interesting thing to note about um, the expanded hydrogel is that because your, your hydrogel is sitting in water, you actually can use fluorophores or fluorescent molecules that are water soluble. So, so DAPI that labels um, DNA and another fluorescent molecule called BODIPI that tends to label um, lipids were able to be just um, diluted into the hydrogel, the water solution that was holding the water, um, holding the uh, hydrogel and it flowed into the sample and you could label those things. So along with microtubules, we could see two other structures quite clearly um, and there's quite spectrally results quite well. And again, you just stack it up and do some 3D imaging and um, there was Gorel. But there is that question about 
what's happening to the DNA um, confirmation in the nucleus after expansion, because with this sample, there was no DNA added. So this was just proteinase to break up those protein uh, bonds, but no DNA. So um, there is a question of how the DNA might be um, altered because of the expansion. Same goes with the lipid droplets that what, what we think are the um, pink dots here. So we're not sure what's happening, but it seems like they're giving us quite convincing images um, when we label them with these molecules. That's just a little side note there. So, um, so people have done a lot of these expansion and super resolution combinations. Um, it's been around for quite a bit. Um, you know, if you can do it with um, expansion and you put it on a sim microscope. Um, so they, a lot of them have done this on the synaptonemo complex of Drosophila and they were able to model um, this thing. Um, in B, they've done it. They've done expansion on with Sophie. So this is where you have your sample expressing a fluorescent protein, which um, survives the um, expansion protocol, which is quite handy. And then you have your have that fluorescent protein um, photo switching. Uh, and there was you can also do um, of course expansion palm. So that's that's what's in um, panel D of microtubules, and taking it again again to um, expansion microscopy. And then you're putting it on a stead microscope that is more like um, you know, it's, it's like a confocal system where it can handle any type of fluorophore. It doesn't have to blink or anything, and you can um, get get, um, get that extra resolution gain as well. Uh, same with uh, GNH, where um, this was also far be looking using the ultra expansion microscopy um, uh, protocol to look at uh, central structures that were quite close to what they expected to see in EM. But of course, the one that I was going for was the expansion single molecule approach, which is because I was already doing so much single molecule imaging. And overall, um, once you perform this method, you get a, typically about a 3.2 times physical expansion because one of the steps actually shrinks your gel from that four times to a slightly smaller gel. Um, and this comes with a re-embedding re step where you have to put your original hydrogel with another gel to hold it in place and withstand that the some switching buffer that's required for the photo switching. Um, and what you can do after you've embedded, re-embedded this gel is actually immunolabel after expansion. That can be quite tricky and there are quite a few, it's not, I haven't found a very consistent way to do it, but sometimes it does work and it, when it works, it um, sort of minimizes that fluorophore target offset that will come when you sort of expand it, sample further on. And of course, you can do 3D imaging on these expanded gels. And these images are the ones that um, Fabi got of um, isolated centrioles and um, imaging them with expansion single molecule imaging. So the, the whole expansion um, microscopy assay is, is quite straightforward and it, it can be done without any very specialized um, um, hardware or um, equipment. So a lot, a lot of the new ones that, that I love the new expansion papers that I've seen, they, they tend to introduce all these um, you know, these cool little structures uh, or like little 3D printed um, things to hold your gel or to, um, to have your gel um, polymerize in a certain structure, but you can do it on the cheap, um, so to speak. So all you really need to do is, you know, you see your cells and you transfect them or you treat them with whatever drug treatment you're interested in and you fix them um, as you would, as if you were just doing um, conventional fluorescence imaging. And you immunolab immunolabel them with a, um, a compatible fluorophore. So Alexa 532 in this case is my go-to. And then it's the linker molecule, I think that's the important one. The acrylo um, X, Esther, what I've also found is that you could replace this Aquilo X with um, an excess of um, glutaraldehyde. Um, and it actually also sort of formed a linker into the um, acrylamide gel. I'm not sure how it worked, but it actually did work quite well. And then what you do is then you add your hydrogel matrix in and you activate it with your APS and your TMED. 
So this is all just the conventional stuff in all those papers. And then you digest it in your proteinase K enzyme um, and expand it and you image it. Um, so this is, so again, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can have your expand, expanding hydrogels in any cake tin. So these are um, some expanding hydrogels in some cake tins we bought at um, the local shop. And so you can see here, the gel is getting quite big. Um, so they started off at about two centimeters and then they grow up to about, um, yeah, they can grow up quite, quite big. And then obviously we have to cut them up in the right shape. And I'll just talk about that um, in a second right now. Okay, so the two expansion methods that I was using was the pro-EXM method with the acrylo-EX and digestion step and the MAP protocol that in, was instead of digesting your sample, you were denaturing it with SDS. So the pro EXM uses the ACX link using the standard um, the Tilburg um, uh, monomer recipe with your um, acrylamide, your um, bisacrylamide, and your sodium acrylate. And it digests in Fronis K um, overnight ideal. So this is the step where you can't skim on it. So this one happens, has happened um, for as long as you can. So it can't really just sleep in for an hour. It has to be overnight or at 37 degrees for six hours at least. And then that will give you a, a full expansion of, you know, that, um, your four times expansion. And then you gotta keep measuring your gel um, every couple of hours or so and replace the water as the gel is expanding. And once you have that original gel that is um, expanded four times, then you can cut it up into a shape where you know the cells you need to cut the gel in an orientation such that you know which side the cells are on. And a good trick that Fabi taught me was to cut it into this sort of SIM card-like shape. So it's an elongated rectangle, and then you cut off um, one of the edges, and you just keep track of where your cells are. Because this was this is sort of one of the things that the students always messed up was not remembering which side their cells are on because the gel will keep flipping in your expanding solution. So keeping track of where the cells are is actually quite an important one. Um, especially if you're going to put it in, you know, you're going to take it further with re-embedding and all that. Um, so the re-embedding step, which is what's crucial for the D-Storm bit, is an acrylamide and bisacrylamide recipe that doesn't have your sodium acrylate because it's the sodium acrylate that um, allows that expansion. So it's that um, ionic, um, it's that charge interaction with water to allow it to expand. So without the sodium acrylate, your gel becomes a bit more rigid. And if you put in a salt buffer, which is essentially the photo switching buffer, your gel is not going to shrink. So that's the purpose of the re-embedding buffer. And then you take your re-embedded gel um, onto a cover glass that is ideally coated with like a polyalysine or a silane solution to get it to stick onto that cover glass. And then you can add your switching buffer without the gel floating away so your gel is again um, attached to the surface and then you can perform the some imaging there. Um, with the MAP protocol, the linker molecule doesn't have to be the acrylax, it could be, oh sorry, it's formaldehyde instead of acrylo-AX and a bit of um, um, acrylamide as well as your linker system. And the gelation recipe is also slight, is different from the pro -XM. Again, this is um, all been published already. And what the gel that comes out of this is slightly more rigid than the pro -XM one. So this can handle a bit more manual handling when you're putting it into your denaturation buffer. That's gonna be SDS based typically. And um, that doesn't have to go on for too long, I think two hours max should be good enough to get your um, sample denatured. And then that'll give you your expansion four times um, from that. And again, the re-embedding is the same recipe. Again, so it's the same gel, re-embedded in the same solution, um, bind onto the cover glass again, that is treated and um, imaged with the storm. So the labeling for the map um, protocol would actually happen after, sorry, after the um, re-embedding. So you immediately label through the gel, your primary and your secondary or a conjugate antibody, and then you image using these stuff. So this is where 
you really have to keep track of which side your cells are on. So you're only putting your antibody solution on that side. So you're not, you don't, you're not wasting antibody volume. Um, and there are cases where that I've seen where he, or antibody is not really penetrating through the entire gel. And I'll show you an example of that um, in a bit. Uh, so those are the two uh, methods I was using. So pro exam label before expansion and the map one label after expansion. And I've had some success um, with both four different projects. Uh, so the first one, I'll just show some of the um, results we got from this project, looking at the chrome tin lens cape of T cells. Um, this was in collaboration with um, Steve. So these are quite small T cells looking at the nuclear lamina. So it's just a, um, the boundary of the nuclear uh, membrane. And they were looking at these histone modifications that would either activator marks or repressor marks in terms of the transcription. So K4 ME3 was activator mark. And from just two color D storm imaging, these were really good, really good images. Um, seeing that it was they were distributed mostly in the center, with this kind of distribution. And then the repressor marks like K9 ME3 were sitting at the periphery of the nucleus. And so, you know, they were quite happy with two color D storm already, and they were doing a lot of these radial distribution analysis and quantifying um, how these distributions change with the um, differentiation of the T cell from like naive to affected to memory T cells. Um, and the, the, their motivation also you know, motivated us to keep developing our imaging uh, capabilities. So we pushed um, to try and get to do, start to do 3D D storm imaging of the, the whole nuclear lamina with the hopes of doing a 3D radial distribution of these. Um, histone marks in influenza mice models. Um, so especially with the K4ME3, even though this was a really good image, they, I mean, there was still this sort of push to see, can we improve the resolution of these structures, but not so much to see them, you know, not, not so much improve the resolution, but more to just decrowd and pull everything apart because it's a really condensed, um, you know, the nucleus is really condensed. So you just want to pull it apart and see if we can tease out any of these uh, more interesting structures in there. And this is um, where I started to do expand exchange microscopy of these K4M3 marks together with lamin. So again, these two structures were labeled with um, Lexaflow 532 using the pro-EXM method. And so this is our unexpanded T cell K4M3 for reference. And this is the expanded size. So this is like the actual size compared to that. Um, and you can see it's much bigger and we can start to see similar detail to what we would see with D-Storm. Uh, but again, this is wide field. So, you know, if you had confocal, it might get um, slightly clearer um, images here. But the goal was to do pro EXM and D storm. And so this is what it looked like. Again, the reference two color D storm image up here. And these are your expanded um, lamin and activator histone modifications. And what you could see was that we could start to tease out these puncture like structures and that got them really excited because there are these things called topologically associated domains. And Steve got really excited thinking you know, those each of those individual spots could be um, one of those tad structures. So it's not so much, I'm, I'm not so much, we weren't really doing this just to improve the resolution, more to decrowd the structure so we can really um, pull apart and see what's inside. And because we were able to do 3D D storm as well, we could take our hydrogel and start to do um, 3D D storm of the expanded nuclear. And again, in Z space, these structures were still quite punctate. You know, it was quite interesting for us to see. But um, I mean, the way we were doing 3D acquisition, there was quite a long um, acquisition period um, for each of these um, cells. So there was um, a bit of improvement to be done there. But um, because we could do 3D D storm of whole cells, we you know had the idea of can we just image one entire cell? And it might not be the best. This is a side-on image of our lamin structure and K4 ME3. And it does look quite similar to what we've seen with 2D D storm unexpanded stuff. So we were quite confident that what we were seeing was actually um, pulled apart quite well. So this is a 
a cell that is now 23 microns in height, as opposed to it normally being about four or five um, on the surface. This is again, it's a top-down image. Um, seeing that similar distribution um, of the active beta mark. Oops. And more importantly, because now these structures are a bit more teased out, we can start to analyze them uh, more, you know, more individually and use more conventional uh, segmenting approaches. And we can start to pull apart, apart these cluster areas and get some um, diameters and the number of, actually the number of localizations per cluster and getting to the point where can we start to tease out how many um, histone mods might be um, you know, in the one of these clusters and that was um, where we were going with this. And just and this is just a comparison with an unexpanded T cell with an expanded one. Again, it's the same sort of field of view. We get much better clarity about these individual punctate structures. Um, uh, there might be these topologically associated domains. Uh, so that was one uh, application of the of pro -XM, um expansion. I mean, D stop, sorry. And another project that we got approached to do was um, from a PhD student, Gemma Stathos, in um, from Melbourne Uni and Monash, as part of um, Maura O'Brien and um, Jenny Zanker's lab. And they wanted to look at sperm cell centrioles. So, um, Centrioles were looked at previously, you know, um, using these domain expansion, but these were isolated centrioles, so like taken out and put on a slide, and they could you know, be counted quite in um, the nine ringlets of um, microtubules could be seen quite clearly. But our aim with this was to, to visualize these centrioles within um, sperm cells. So with the MAP protocol, where you expand first and then label, seem to be quite successful for this sample preparation in particular, um, which was quite good. Well, I was quite happy with that, the way it worked. And because it was, you could label it post-expansion, I could actually put in Alexa Flow 647. And if you're doing DSTORM, you know Alexa 647 sort of blinks better than the 532. So I was quite happy that that could work. I could get my 647 into the, the, um, into the sample. And already, even just with the expansion wide field, the detail we were getting from these sperm heads were quite, was quite good. But because of 6 for 7, we can do d -storm. And so now, with our map expanded d -storm images, what we were seeing could have, um, we were um, trying to tease out whether these could, in fact, be centrioles in the sperm heads. Um, so this is one example. Um, and here's just another one. So they're sort of crossing over each other, um, sort of at the necks of these um, sperm heads. Uh, so that um, are two examples of things I've done with combining expansion with single molecule. And obviously the, the purpose of combining it is so we can sort of double the gain in resolution, um, the 10 times gain from single molecule imaging with the potential 10 times gain from expansion with some of these iterative or these newer um, protocols like TREX and X10 could give us that 100 times resolution over the 200 nanometer diffraction limit for you know, that two to five nanometer resolution that's almost like a single biomolecule. That would be pretty cool to get to. Um, and the takeaway from this is that um, the re-embedding hydrogel with the original hydrogel is really important for single molecule imaging because you need that reducing buffer that's Without the re-embedded gel, your gel is going to shrink. So really that's the key step in doing um, expansion keystone. And with the cases where you need your um, where you need to label before expansion, the five thirty two is the go to because it can survive the pro the process and be suitable for single molecule imaging. But if you can um, label after expansion, then Six for seven um, is the way to go. Uh, and then there's a question of the validation of the expansion factor and how isotropic it is. It is, and there are you know several levels to think about this. Whereas your macro expansion factor is when you just measure the hydrogel um, as you're expanding and seeing that four times gain. The micro expansion factor is 
I would say maybe like of the target of interest. So if it was microtubules, you would go like the width for the T cell nuclei, we're going off um, the diameters and the K for M3, the distributions that were actually quite consistent whether they expanded or not. And the last one would be like the nano expansion factor between individual fluorophores. And can we get to that point where we can start to put in um, intrinsic rulers into the gels because each gel is going to be different with each experiment. Um, so it just um, you got to think of a way to get to figure out, um, to do that measurement with each experiment intrinsically. Um, and of course, some considerations to think about is that your fluorophore target offset is going to increase with expansion. So typically with primary and secondary um, labeling, your fluorophore is going to be a certain distance away from destruction. In this case, you know, your microtubule cross section uh, might be 25 nanometers across, and you add a primary and secondary at either side, and then your maybe localization precision um, for each side, and that will give you maybe a total of 80 nanometers as a typical microtubule width. And then if you go ahead and expand that after you've labeled it, your distance is going to increase dramatically. So this is where um, post expansion labeling is quite important to get your fluorophore as close to the target as possible. Um, another consideration or something you would think about was that the further away you pull apart your target of interest, the less sort of self quenching or homo fret effects might occur. So in a you know your your conventional conventionally immunolabeled microtubule, and you just fill it up with fluorophores and um, antibodies. You know, some of them that might be quite close to each other in the nanometer range might be self-quenched. Whereas if you pull it apart with expansion and then you come in with your labels, each of those fluorophores have a chance um, to light up and it might give you a more continuous structure. Um, so those are some things you were thinking about doing this. Um, and here's one um, not so great image because yes, post-expansion labeling is tricky. And there are some cases where the antibodies seem to not be entering the gel completely. So on the left here, I have, this is a bright field image of a gel. So this is just outside the gel and inside the gel. And when I go to the white field with the um, laser on, there, is, there was a distinct line where there was no fluorescence inside the gel. So what appeared to be happening was that the antibodies weren't able to penetrate that gel. So um, with the post-expansion labeling, um, I think what needs to happen is that your original gel has to be completely expanded to be sure that those pores are as big as possible, um, or the the um, the position where you start your antibody labeling is on the right side. So sometimes you do on the wrong side, you might not get that um, complete penetration of the of the antibodies. And so we were getting this these weird artifacts of like. Um, no signal after a certain point. So, so it is still quite tricky. Um, and then of course, if if labeling, um, if, if you don't want to do anti um, immunolabeling, um, fluorescent proteins are ideal because some of them tend to survive the expansion process. So this is GFP signal and expanded gel, the GFP on a um, viral protein that's um, made it through the expansion process. So Sophie is the, um, the fluorescence fluctuation super resolution method that can be used for live cell imaging. So it's as long as you get your um, fluorescent protein in to the expanded gel and it still behaves in that photo switching, um, in the photos, it, it can still photo switch in the right way. You can perform probably this expansion Sophie method. And I think this is um, so ex combining expansion with Sophie was how they got that. Uh, one microscopy where they were able to get down to that one nanometer resolution um, thing that I saw on Twitter. But yeah, so this is where I'm, this is one of the things I'm, I'm going to try next. And then another application um, that I was going to try expansion on uh, would be to look at uh, what I'm trying to do in my current, current research is to look at the effects of low dose um, anti cancer drugs. So um, this is where um, these drugs that um, target microtubules. How are they affecting that subcellular structure at really low doses that would be most clinically relevant? And um, so far, we found that they do, uh, in fact, alter the dynamics of microtubule growth and shrinkage and cause some of these curvature effects. So I'm um, planning to try and apply expansion to this. Um, I think that's all I have for today. Um, I'd like to thank my current lab and the Trove University and the
Biomedical Research Initiative. Um, and I thank um, Gabriella and the RMS team for allowing me to give a talk today. Thank you. Lastly, that was great. Um, we'll open now the discussion. So if there's any questions, people can unmute themselves and ask them. Or if you are shy, you can write them on the chat. Um, can I ask a question? Yep. Hi. Um, nice talk, thanks. Um, uh, I was wondering, you showed the body P labeling for the lipids. Do you have uh, any experience with expanding uh, lipid droplets? Because uh, uh, as I heard, it's supposed to be quite tricky. And this is something that we maybe would like to do in our lab. I have experience with uh, different expansion metho methods, but I never tried to expand this kind of uh, organelles. Yes, yeah, so I haven't tried going um, expanding a lipid droplet, you know, specifically on lipid structures, because I know that you would need a, um, I think I saw that paper was, they had that fatty acid with an acrylamide group on it. So you actually had to incorporate that in. But I, I for that sample, I just put in Bodipi and it seemed to go to what looked like the right place. Like it looks like lipid droplets. I mean, I could be wrong. It could just be floating in the gel. Um, but yes, that is something I am um, actively um, looking at so the um, expansion of lipid droplets with the right linker molecules, I think, would be important yeah. um, for that case. Yeah, but I haven't tried anything yet. Okay, thank you. Have, have you tried any of those linker molecules, those new ones? I haven't tried to do anything with the lipid, <laughs> lipid droplets yet. I tried, um, di uh, actually, I used different uh, cross linker than you use, but it's like I, I think it's uh, more of the same. It's I use the MA and HSS. Uh, I use the uh, NHS ester, MA NHS ester. So it's like, it's also acrylate with the uh, NHS group. So yeah, so it won't work for lipids anyways. So, but actually there is a nice uh, uh, protocol published for, uh, it's not for like actually lipid droplets labeling, but it's like for membrane labeling. They have this um, lipid dye that binds. It's a, uh, it's like a conventional staining actually, but you just uh, use it for staining the. You like uh, add this uh, dye. It binds to the lipids before the expansion, and it has a um, uh, stratavidin on its end. So then, uh, I know maybe biotin. No, I don't remember. Maybe bi biotin on its end on one side. And like the other side is like a lipid, some kind of a fatty acid or whatever. So it binds to lipids. And uh, after expansion, you just stand it with a secondary antibody connected to streptavidin and then you visualize it. Oh, okay. Streptavidin. Okay, okay. But uh, that would be, I suppose, for all lipids because you're not. Yeah, it's all lipids. lipids. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, it's not like from my experience, I would see uh, a lot of background staining and like uh, I would see like uh, membranes mostly, but not like lipid droplets or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I was quite surprised to see like those yeah. things showing up quite nicely. Um, you, yeah. you can image, do you image your cells before and after the expansion to compare uh, the images? Um, right now, no, because we um, it's quite tricky. We don't really have the automation set up quite yet to do that. Um, because at... you, um, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no. Because if you you stand before the expansion, right? So if you stand before the expansion, you can image before, and then image afterwards, mm -hmm. and then you can compare the images and see if it localizes to the same place. Yeah, I, uh, I, I mean, I suppose Bodipi would survive everything. Yeah. Oh, do you add Bodipi after? Yeah, after because it was um, it's just water soluble, so I just floated in. But yeah, actually, probably, probably survive. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 
Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks. Actually, I was actually wondering about the uh, blinking buffers. Are there any different to regular buffers you would use for super resolution in this case, or? Um, not really, not. So I'll just use 100 millimolar MEA. Mm -hmm. um, also, yeah, actually, I would also use the um, oxygen scavenging system because it's for the 532. And I, I haven't checked, but I can't, I'm thinking about it now, whether pH would be an effect. So I normally have my buffers at about pH 9, uh, yeah. but I, I don't think that, that affects the hydrogel too much because it seems to work. I, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, just the conventional ones would do. I mean, if you had maybe more salts in your buffer, you might have to, it might shrink a bit more. Because right now I'm getting a the shrinkage from four times to about 3.2 times. Um, but that's still not as bad as if you don't re embed. Yeah. Hey, Ash. Hey, Paul. A nice talk. Um, on the uh, post expansion staining, so you mm -hmm. mentioned you had the issue in terms of penetration. Have you played around with incubation times and concentrations to see whether or not that can that can help? Certainly, in terms of things like light sheet labeling, that can that can help a little bit. Yeah, um, definitely incubation temperature. Um, I felt concentration didn't help too much. I think temperature was the one that got me to the end. Um, and definitely the orientation of where the uh, antibody solution starts. So obviously I want to use as little as possible, just you know, put a drop on top of where I know my cells are. Um, yeah, temperature, I think, but I typically do 37 incubation anyway. That's that was my go-to. But I didn't really I didn't find concentration helped that much. So I like, you know, one of my daring um, experiments, I just used a lot of antibodies and it didn't make it through and it felt a bit wasted, but um, I have a feeling it's to do with how much the gel has, has expanded. So it really has to expand as much as it can. So sort of opening up the pores for the entire gel. Cause I think also that at the edge of the hydrogel, it might be slightly more open than the inside. So sometimes in the gelation process, if that is not even, your insides might be, be a bit more cross-linked than the outsides kind of thing. Yeah. And then in terms of that, uh, that approach, the post-expansion labeling, I mean, you said you were trying to get away with the minimum amount of labeling, but presumably you're using more than you would be on the pre-expansion labeling. Yes, yeah, for sure, yeah. It's expensive, more expensive. Yes, yes, yes. I like uh, I think one time I was using a mill of like antibody solution, not not and not like diluted antibody solution, but still a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's supposed to fun. Okay, very cool. Any more questions? Um. I think that was very handy to give us all these tips. Um, they are very useful. Um, the other thing I will point out is um, the people from Canada organized their meeting and they had eight boys in speaking. So that recording will also be available um, under discussion as well. So you'll say guys any of this from the expansion group. Um, and also I posted the link on the chat uh, there's the master Google document where you we are sort of recording attendance if you can put your name in there. And there's also a um, discussion group. So uh, in there, if you have any questions or you try something um, and or you can ask if someone has tried something, uh, that would be good. Um, I think if there's no further questions, I guess we can finish this session. Uh, thank you again, Ashley. And Thanks, um, okay. and uh, if you have any questions or you know you want to speak in this meeting or you know someone that would like to speak in our next meeting, just please reach out. That's it. Thank you.